Okay, perfect. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Here we go. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the next, uh, until 3 p.m., because of course we started late, but until 3 p.m., we are going to talk about, uh, in this open mic session, we are going to talk about scientific collaborations and, and beyond science and culture. This is not a talk, uh, a specific talk where I have to say uh, something specific or so important about that topic, but much more like an introduction to start the, communi this, the communication between us and where we can open this forum and, and exchange ideas about um, how we can uh, collaborate much more efficiently beyond cultures and beyond um, countries. So um, the, the, generally the first question I always ask is, are we culturally so different? I think that uh, 100 years ago definitely it was the case. But today, for example, when I put a picture like this, which I did in my talk yesterday, I'm pretty sure that 99.9% .9 of the people in the room uh, know exactly who these people are. And if you ever step foot in the United States, you realize that the Simpsons, they are really an American family. Like, really, they are an American family. I'm not saying that all Americans are like the Simpsons, but their way of life, the way their house looks like, when you step into an American house, they have, for example, wooden houses, which for me was a big surprise because in Africa, only poor people have houses in wood. But in the United States, 80% of the houses, bad houses, best houses, they are generally wooden houses. When you enter into an American house, it looks like this most of the time. The, the, the <coughs> sorry, their jokes, their, what is going on in their life, the school, the school bus, it's very, very an American thing. But somehow, whenever you put this picture everywhere, actually, people recognize who these people are. I remember I had a cousin, this was like 10 or 15 years ago, because where I live, actually, every uh, summer, our parents sent us to the village so that we can, you know, be with the, with the grandparents. And back then, uh, there were not uh, a lot of places in our village where you could watch TV. So he will walk, my cousin will walk kilometers every Saturday or Sunday to see the episodes of The Simpsons. Is how to tell you how important that was for him. And uh, when I, for example, put something like this, which I did yesterday, everybody understands the joke. So for us, it's something normal to know about Simpson and all the Simpson jokes and everything. But when we think about it, actually, it is not that much because this is something that is profoundly rooted in one culture. So um, somehow today, because of this world where we are interconnected, we are sometimes much more close in culture than what we think. Sometimes we think that because we come from different cultures, we don't necessarily can communicate, but we have vectors of culture, like, for example, the Simpsons, that somehow uh, bind us. So there are some differences that are obvious. Race, which is a very obvious difference. Uh, you have multiracial countries, countries that are not multiracial, but relationships between race are not so evident and not so <coughs> obvious. You have national and ethnical origin. This just roots in history. Uh, you have countries where people have a tendency to get along very well, and countries where they kind of don't like their neighbors. And it's been like that for hundreds of years, and it's still like that today. Even though I do think that we are living one of the most peaceful times of mankind history. Um, gender. How do we deal with gender issues? How do females deal with men? How do men deal with females? This is not the same thing if you are in Cameroon, in France, in the US, in India, in China, in Zimbabwe, it's not the same thing. There are some differences sometimes that are big, sometimes that are small, subtle, and most of the time we're not even aware of it. Why? Because we just are, it's like, you know, I always say it's difficult to convince a fish that he's wet. If you are somewhere in some culture, then you behave a certain way, and you don't necessarily understand that other people behave in a radically different way. Uh, wealth. Um, generally, in rich countries, they have a set of rules that they respect. And in countries where wealth is not so abundant, generally, they have other sets of rules. Um, language, very important. We know today that English is <coughs> sorry, the lingua franca uh, of, of research. If you want to do research, you need to, be, you need to have a sufficient command of English. That's just what it is. So we have our fellows that are native English speakers to have that advantage that they already master English, which is good. Uh, those who are not native English speakers generally have to make the effort to go to that. And some people are very willing to make the efforts and others not so much. 
um, religion. Um, you have, once again, differences of religion, sometimes within the country, sometimes across borders. How do we deal with that? There are areas where it's very difficult to evolve when you don't have the dominant religion and areas where actually people are much more tolerant. Uh, sexual orientation. Um, if, for example, you are gay or transgender, the way you will be treated will not be the same in the United States or in France or in my home country, Cameroon, for example, where it is illegal to be uh, homosexual. So uh, generally, whenever you take all of these issues, uh, we generally think that we are tolerant and we can accept differences without much difficulty. Here in the room, I don't think, how many nationalities do we have here? Uh, more than 20. More than 20. So, uh, and I think that so far we did get along very well. We don't have problems. Uh, we interact well with each other. It's, it's, not a, it's not a big problem. Sometimes we see some people doing this thing that way, and we're like, okay, fine. If you want to do it that way, you know, I don't have a problem with that. So, most of the time, the differences that we see do not disturb us. And uh, what we think is that this, these variations of, of this difference of culture are, are a richness for. Um, for mankind. And um, when these differences disturb us, because sometimes in other cultures we see stuff and we're just like, okay, I will not say anything, but I don't like it. Uh, sometimes when these differences disturb us, then we think that we're intelligent and smart enough to just disregard it and just, you know, move on with our own way of doing things. But uh, generally, I do think that we underestimate the importance of culture. I still stress that I believe that intercultural relationships are way better than they have ever been in the history of mankind. But still, sometimes, I think that we tend to underestimate the uh, importance of culture. So this is my personal equations. I always say that every human being is in path integral between his birth there and now, his birthplace and here. You integrate around the environment in space and time. That is you. So in that environment, <coughs> spatial temporal function, you have what I call a random effect, which is the family. If you're born in a family of people that are very open-minded, generally you will be open-minded. If you're born in a family that is rich, where on every vacation you just go to Trieste to spend your vacations, it's not the same thing as, you know, you're born in a family that is poor, and when on vacations you have, for example, to work for, uh, to pay the tuition for the next year. So this is something that is random, you don't have a, you cannot master that, and, and this is the same thing for all of us. We're just born in a family and that's it. And this effect, I think, is deterministic. This is not noise, it's culture. Very probably, if you're born uh, in Saudi Arabia, you will be Muslim, very probably. Very probably, if you're born in a predominantly Christian country, you'll be Christian. If you are born in India, you will much more be belong to one of the Indian religions. Um, if you're born in France, much probably you will speak French and uh, think that the French system is the best system. And if you're born in America, you will think that America is the greatest thing on earth. That's just what it is. This part, the culture, the fact that the main field around you thinks a certain way, speaks a certain way, understands the world a certain way, this polarizes you even if your family within that culture is rich or poor or this or that. Generally, this exactly defines how we dress, how we speak, how we interact with people. This is the most important thing generally, and we underestimate it. We think that we are you know, individuals that are free of uh, free thinkers, and we have ideas because we are intelligent enough to figure it out ourselves. So culture is very inbuilt, very deeply. This is truly something that I, that I think. And um, some manifestations of inbuilt <coughs> social differences are well known. Management of social <coughs> hierarchy problems. How do we deal with people that are above us? When you are a PhD student and you have an advisor and you disagree, for example, how do you manage that? In, I would say, Western countries, in my experience, um, you know, the PhD can just come to his advisor and say, you know, I think that this thing goes in a way that I don't like. You know, I'm not satisfied with this and that, and generally you can openly discuss that. In other countries, it's not necessarily so. Uh, you have countries that have very stiff social hierarchy. Most African countries, for example, if I wanted to talk about something that I know, the social hierarchy is very stiff, and you will not be able to talk with your supervisor or anyone that is socially higher than you as freely as you will do, for example, in a Western country. 
uh, management of gender issues. Um, it's not the same thing, depending on the country, where you are, and the culture. Um, the way you even talk to females is, is, is not the same. Uh, I remember, for example, something I like to do is, I like uh, when I organize conferences in Africa to bring some uh, Western colleagues. Uh, and for most of them, most of the time, is the first time they come to Africa. And of course, what they see when they are there is very, very different um, than, than what they think. And I remember one day, one of my colleagues, I went there with them and I organized a conference, and after that, we told the country. And it was like, you, you, I'm very surprised the way you talk to females. I'm like, what, what is that? It's like, you're always so respectful. Not me, but it was like the, 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 the people. And actually thought bad about it, and it's true. Like, in Africa, the, the, it is, you cannot be rude to a female that you don't know. You, it's, it's, very, it's not accepted that you talk to a female and you are rude. But because they were coming from abroad, they had the idea that, you know, we're polygons and, like, you know, females are not important, what, what, what. And they arrived, and they see a country where actually we are very, very careful about, you know, how we address the opposite sex and vice versa. So um, gender issues are very, which doesn't mean that there are no problems. There are. And of course, I'm sure that you know, a lot of people from southern countries, they arrive in the West and they see that the proportion of females that are in a position of power is higher than in their country. That, you know, I don't know, 20, 25 percent of females will be director of the institute or you know, a big professor. And maybe they're not very used to that when they come from you know, a southern country. So we are not necessarily the same by the way we manage gender issues. This is very culturally um, uh, driven. Management of success failure. Uh, some people say that one of the <coughs> sorry, big advantage of, for example, the American society is that it is a society that manages well failure. They say, hey, you know, try it. It doesn't work, no problem, you try again. But other societies, people don't want to try because when they fail, people finger point them. Oh, you, didn't, you couldn't make it. For example, this is, and I could see that. I could see how it's different in Africa and in Europe and in the United States, the way that young uh, master degree or PhD students do things. Clearly, you talk to Americans, they try different things. When it works, they capitalize. When it doesn't work, they still capitalize because, you know, I've done something that didn't work. Has, uh, I think there's a famous quote by Edison. I think he invented the bulb after 100 trials, and he said, I discovered 99 ways not to find a bulb, or something like that, which is really an American vision of success and failure, which is not prevalent, believe me. Elsewhere in the world, generally, people are shy to try because when they fail, the society finger points them. Uh, management of interaction with unknown colleagues, which is very important. When you arrive here, most of the people that are here, you don't know them. So how do you interact? There are societies where it's very easy to, hey, how do you do? My name is this, etc. And societies that are much more like, you know, it's difficult to talk to, to people that you don't know. Uh, management of social interaction with people you know. This also is not an easy thing. Uh, management of resolution of personal conflicts. When you disagree with someone, how do you manage that? Um, once again, this is something that is done differently depending on the country. So um, I always encourage young scientists to be aware of these differences in culture because this is the most important thing they will have to face in their career if they want to, be, to have what I call a successful career. You will not have a successful career if you stay in your country and do not interact with people outside. Even if you are the most clever guy, you will be successful when, <coughs> sorry, you will, be inter you will be able to interact with people from your country, which is easy, you speak the same language, you have the same culture, etc. blah, blah, blah. But you will need somehow to be able to interact with people that are not like you. Not the same gender, not the same sex, not the same political views, not the same anything. You still, need to be able to interact with these people efficiently. Uh, one point is you need to fine tune the public representation of yourself. Be aware that when you walk, people look at you, people analyze you, they don't know you. So the only thing that they, the first idea that they have of you is the way you are. You need to be aware of that. I will take you a very simple example. As Africans, we speak loud. That's just how we are, we speak loud. You go in African street, everyone is in the, ha, 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 and they speak very, very loud. And there, and I realized that, for example, when I'm with my African friends, like in France, for example, and when we speak, 
even, I don't know, we're, I don't know, just in the street, we really do speak loud. We're not aware of that. And it took me some time to realize that. But for other peoples, it is rude. Because generally in Europe, people, when they speak, they're like, you know, bonjour, comment ça va, etc. And we say, bonjour, comment ça va? So it's another, and it's just, the way we, it's just the way we speak. We just speak loud. And of course, if you come here in Europe for, you know, one week and you go back to Africa, it's not a problem. But if you have to come in every conference, and in every conference when you're in the building, people know you're there, even though you're not doing anything wrong, if you're not aware that this thing is not universal, then maybe people will be like, yeah, this guy is a nice guy, but man, he speaks too loud. <laughs> so be aware of that. This, I'm taking just this example, but there are a lot of examples. Uh, different things that are very inbuilt with us, we don't necessarily realize. Fine tune the public representation of yourself. Be aware that the people who s will judge you, because even though we say we don't judge people, we judge people by their appearance when we don't know them. After that, when you know the people, you can fine tune, but at the beginning, you don't know people, so you judge what you see, okay? So like, you know, the way you dress, the way you talk to people, you have to be very careful about that because that's how people will judge you first. Like, for example, um, there is, I saw one day someone in, on television that was talking about the social distances. In America, for example, the social distance is large. If you come to less than 20 centimeters close to an American, it will feel very uncomfortable. Very. But for example, for Asians, it's, it can be very close. For Africans, it's, I would say it's intermediate. But for Americans, for example, they don't like when you touch them. And it's just cultural. You, hey, how do you do? You touch him, it's, it's they kind of cringe. In French, for example, you see someone, hey, how do you do? We have the, it's very like, you know. In the US, no, it's some kind of hug. It's, it, they have a social distance that is, and, and when you arrive there, you need to understand that. So when you arrive in a place that, where you, that is not your culture, you need to be very aware of what are the cultural codes and be sure that you blend in. And don't come with your own way of doing things and think that everybody will have to accept that. I always insist on that. It's always very, very important because in your career you will have to travel a lot and, you know, be always very, 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 very um, aware of the fact that very little things like that, you touching people or you speaking loud or you laughing loud, little things like that that you can think are not harmful actually can have a great impact about how people view you. Um, Cross-cultural awareness permits strong and reliable connection with other scientists. Um, generally what you want in your career is to be able to know people from different continents and have very good relationships with them. This will not occur if you are culturally arrogant. You might want it or not, but sometimes if you're not culturally aware that you know these other scientific colleagues are different, I need to be very careful about the way I interact with them. If you're not aware of that, you're intercultural relationships might not be very, very successful. Um, it prepares you to compete efficiently for funds, for fellowships, for grants, etc. Generally, as you will evolve in your career, you will um, compete for, I don't know, international fellowship. This is an international fellowship. Uh, it's funded by, uh, maybe we should acknowledge the funders that are NSF, uh, no, not NSF. Oh, ICTP. ICTP, of course. Uh, Ameri APS, American Physical Society. IOP, Institute of Physics, mm -hmm. which is in, in England and Britain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the European Physical Society. And EPS. Yes, EPS. Okay. So you are here, most of you are here, owing to a funding that does not come from your country. So I suppose that, <coughs> sorry, you had to do an application, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is already a first step in your career when you have to come out of your culture and compete, because it was a competition. I know personally people who wanted to come here. Yes, there were more than 300 applicants, so, and we had something like a little less than 50. So it accepted. was like 20, less than 20% yeah. success rate? Yes. Okay. So somehow that you did write or do in your application made the people who were doing the selection say, okay, we want this person here and others not. So be aware of that that generally when you will compete inter uh, internationally, um, you need to understand how at the international level uh, things work. It's very important. Um, and it also allows you to enhance your communication skills with everyone, okay? When you just understand how you can interact with people from different culture, it enables you to, be, to build stronger relationship with them. I think this is obvious. So I have a quantum formulation of the problem. Generally, generally a collaboration is going to be 
good and bad. It's some kind of like quantum superposition of both. And what you want actually is just to have a reduction to this eigenstate. And now the problem, the, the, because I'm sure that every scientist, of course, want to be, to get along with all the other ones. But now the question is, how do you get to this? And I'm right here. So open questions. Um, and of course, there are other questions. So I will invite you to share your views and your ideas about, about this topic. Um, from a general perspective, how do you think cross-cultural collaborations in science could be improved? Um, in your opinion, how could young researchers de from developing countries develop their collaboration skills? Um, how could NOSAR programs like the hands-on school could be improved to meet their goals much more efficiently? Because of course, the people who set up the school, they have an idea, but they need your feedback to fine-tune things and make it better. Me, for example, is the third time that I come to the hands-on and I can see every time I come that there are new things that are added to make the program better and meet better your expectations. Um, what are optimal strategies to develop south-south <coughs> south co uh, south -south collaborations? And much more importantly, um, are there key ideas related to this open forum that you think uh, should be discussed or considered? And of course, this is, this is not uh, an exclusive set of questions. If you have other questions, and not necessarily questions, if you have ideas that you want to share or experiences that you want to share, please uh, feel free. This is an open forum. Thank you. Floor is open for comments. Please state your name and then uh, make your comment. I'm Shmaila, and I just have one question regarding this uh, uh, second comment you made, open question. Um, Which comment, sorry? Uh, not uh, the open question. In your opinion, how young researchers uh, yes. researcher from developing countries develop their collaboration skills? Okay. I have. Uh, my question is not about collaboration skills. My question is when, for example, there are different writing styles. The writings are different. In Asia, the uh, writing style is mostly very long. In Europe, it's very concise. In America, it is different. So when you go into the international pool uh, to apply for a funding, these things matter a lot. So how we can, how we are able to uh, compete there, how we are able to, uh, how we to are adjust. able to manage that, yeah, how we are able to adjust that difference. Uh, good, uh, that's, that's a good point. Um, I will just share my personal experience about that. Uh, I remember um, I applied uh, for a fellowship uh, once to go, to go, to, go to, to, to NASA, it was a NASA fellowship, and the first time I applied, I didn't get it. And um, I was very curious to ask my, my supervisor, my prospective supervisor, why it didn't work. So I, and it was, you were not bold enough. Your, your project was too conservative. We were sure that you could make it. So that's not what we wanted here. We wanted something much more risky, which was different from what I was used to in Europe, where if you say something that is too risky, then they're like, this is science fiction. We don't want to fund it. <laughs> we want to fund something realistic. And um, I wrote a second project that was very risky that, to be honest with you, at the beginning, I was not sure that I could make. And uh, I got the fellowship. And I went there. And finally, I could say what I was writing, what I, what I wrote. So I would say, depending on which country, what kind of fellowship you're talking about, depending on the country, depending on the program, uh, it's very important to adapt to what really you want to do. It's, I, I would say it's the key word, to adapt. Uh, if, um, you are, you, if you compete for American funds, I think it's important to know exactly what kind of, of proposals generally they want to see. Maybe read one, two, three proposals that have been successful before see a little bit the style, the level of competition, the level of, of risk, because there's always risk in science. If you do science that is not risky at all, it's not research. It's just development. If you want to do research, it means that there is some part of unknown and risk, but different cultures accept different parts. For example, in Africa, if you want to say to do something very risky, you will not get funded, because they are like, you know, we are poor countries. We still have to build roads, schools, hospitals. 
Yes, we can give money to research, but if it's to do something that is very likely to fail, we don't have money for that. While, you know, much more advanced country, much more advanced countries are much more willing to explore new ideas and might, in the, like in the example that I told you, want projects that are much more risky. So I would say adjust to the call, the specific call that you're talking about, and uh, it's, it's definitely homework that you have to do. I just want to make a comment about what you said about uh, looking at other successful proposals. I'm not sure how universal this is, but in the US, the National Science Foundation puts the one-page summary of every successful program up on its web page. And so if you're, if you're answering a call for a specific proposal, you can see how people wrote previous successful proposals. If such a thing is not available for the program you are applying to, maybe you can find somebody else that you know with, from within your social network who has been successful and ask them to see a copy of the proposal. And I'll just add that um, the point that you made where you went and found out why you didn't get it. Yeah, I think oh, that's yeah. very critical. If you don't get something, ask the person who decided why. Yeah. Then don't be afraid to talk to these people. You know, they don't want to get bad proposals. They don't want to get proposals they don't fund. They want to, they want to be able to tell you what, uh, what's going on, and you should be willing to ask them. Yeah, thank you. That, that is truly very, very important. Uh, sometimes people don't give you feedback, which I don't like, but most of the time, people are willing to give you feedback. And if, for example, I didn't ask why, I would have applied a second year trying to improve my initial project, but not still in the lines that they wanted. So I, I, this is very important, asking for feedback. If you don't ask, they definitely won't give you feedback. That's clear. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to address the same thing. Uh, I also failed some scholarship and whatnot, and I always asked why, why. And usually it was some European fundings, and usually their answer was, we don't give that information. Come on. That, that is true. I, I agree with you. Like, a lot of programs um, generally don't give feedback, which I think is a bad thing, but I actually think that feedback is important even when you are successful. Because sometimes it's useful for you to know why actually they liked your project. You want to know if it's because you wrote well, you want to know if because the topic is important to them. And it's true that um, a lot of funding agencies, because they are bureaucratic, very big things, they don't like to address individual requests. Mm -hmm. So if they have not already foreseen that they want to give feedback, generally they they, they, they just don't give it to you, which is a problem, I totally agree with you. But try all the time, if you can, Try to, to ask for feedback. Yeah, I wouldn't mind even like the, the, the most trivial feedback. Like, like, just what the referee like, say. Yeah, yeah, just the, what the referee Don't say. smell nice. <laughs> then, okay, next time I'll wear a perfume, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. just some, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let me just uh, add uh, something about this, too. So, what we're talking about here, we sort of concentrated on funding, but really, um, this, this sort of thing happens everywhere when you have, it really boils down to communication and something I think we've been talking about in our professional development workshop is, and it was mentioned in Professor Swinney's talk, you got to know your audience, right? So your audience is the, you know, it's just, you know, some funding agency in China or in the U.S. or U.K., even within the U.S., talking about funding. Different agencies have very different philosophies. You have to know what their audience, what your audience is. It doesn't have to be about funding. You're trying to submit to journals, right? Yeah. The journals, okay. they have their they have own particular, you know, approach take. So really it's all you're, you're at a at a conference, you're communicating. You have to know your audience. That really is the key thing. And to the extent you can get information about that, you know, sometimes it's not so readily available. Oftentimes it is, and mm -hmm. you try to incorporate that, and this idea about if you fail, that is an opportunity, not a, you know, it's not, it's not, failing is actually good for you, because it is an opportunity for you to grow, to become a better you. You learn something about yourself, about what you can do better. So don't look at it as, oh, you know, I have to stop. No, look at it as an opportunity, as, as a new beginning. I totally agree with that. And as I say, you see, American point of view, like failure is good for you. <laughs> Sir, uh, my name is Pauline. I'm just curious, uh, what is the criteria, main criteria to be selected in ICTP workshop? 
<laughs> Asking for feedback. Okay, so let me give you some, some what we look for that distinguished your application. So different workshops have their own way of, uh, of judging, okay? I'll tell you what we look for. What we look for was uh, when you gave the reasons why you wanted to attend, you actually said something specific about this workshop. Um, what we see, uh, some fraction of the people who apply are serial appliers. They basically just, you know, send in something that's very generic. They say, here's my reason. It didn't really connect very well with what the underlying ideas or themes of the workshop were. But I would say that everyone here made that effort and we recognize that and that's important. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, uh, we w we were not so much. We looked at your background, you and, and looked at uh, y you know your prior work. But actually, that for us was less important because we wanted to bring people who were in early in their career. So they may not have a long. Tr you know, most of you have a track. Some of you have a, a pretty extensive extensive track record, but most of you haven't had such. And so, really, we were looking for. We actually rejected a number of people who were very senior. You know, is that oh, we have lots of publications and such, but they've had their opportunity and they're clearly established. We wanted to go for people who were early, um, were enthusiastic, were clearly saw this specifically as something that was important to advancing their career, your career, and that's what we looked for. But again, that's what we look for. Different audiences, namely the different uh, activity directors, will look for something different. But I'll just say that's what we had in mind. Is it just an to um, I can't speak for the other activities. <laughs> I'll speak for what we, you know, the hands-on schools. But that is good. They say you apply the lesson that you learned today. Ask for feedback. Yes, that's good. <laughs> good question. I'm Alejandro from Venezuela. Uh, recommendation letters have the same value in different countries when you make an application? I don't know, I mean, just, is a question? Uh, in my experience, yes. Um, there are some countries where, um, because it, it depends also on the program. Sometimes you have like, I don't know, you have 20 positions, you have 1,000 1, applications, and all, everyone has more or less the same level, for example, for a PhD uh, fellowship you are flooded with like, you know, transcripts. You don't have the time really to. So you prefer to read the recommendation letters where people say, you know what, I know this person. And generally the, the, the recommendation letter depends who writes it and how less general it is. Because sometimes people just write, trip, oh yes, he's a good student, I recommend him. This has no value. If someone writes a letter like that for you, it's not helping you because of course, you will not write a recommendation letter to say, you know, he sucks, he's not good, whatever. But we want generally in the re recommendation letter to say, them to say something specific about you. Uh, he can say, you know what, he, he may be not very good theoretically, but he is very motivated, he works very hard. This, for example, is a genuine honest comment that I will keep in mind, rather than someone just saying, oh, he's very bright, he's just the best student, and yeah. So that's my very personal experience. So if when someone writes recommendations later for you, um, Try to ask them to be specific. Be sure that you ask someone who really wants to write a recommendation letter for you because sometimes people just don't want. This occurred even to me. Someone comes and you're like, honestly, you're not that a good student. I don't want to recommend you. And generally the students take it bad while actually I'm helping them. Because if I feel forced to write a letter, partially if I want to recommend him to someone that I know, I cannot say that you're the brightest student when I know that he will value my opinion, maybe give you the position, and after that, feel like I betrayed him. So when you feel like someone is, doesn't want to write a letter for you, don't force. Be sure that the person that writes the letter truly wants to do it. Let, let me just add one more thing, and then I'll pass it on to the other mm -hmm. hands-on. Uh, specifically, again, for this activity, um, we actually solicited uh, input from people who participated in this activity in the past. And we, you know, we actually know from the past participants, there were some who were really outstanding, and those in particular who we were, were very impressive, we listened to them 
very carefully. And so some of you are here because, in fact, we, you received strong recommendations from people who were here at this school in the past. So you have the opportunity to have that influence in the future. We're going to ask you to, when we have future schools, to recommend people, colleagues, uh, and if you're very strong here, we're going to listen to you very carefully because you, you know, you're building your scientific reputation here, right now, uh, in how you interact, how you participate, um, how, you know, how much enthusiasm, how much you know, commitment, all those sorts of things are really important and you're making the impression now and you so it's not just that you are you know you're applying you actually have influence now on other people's careers in that way so have that in mind <clears throat> yeah just want to add another thing about the recommendation letters i mean the way the system works in the west the recommendation letter should be something confidential and it is the duty of the professors etc to write those letters uh, if they know you uh, if they say no, then absolutely it means they don't have a good opinion, they don't want to hurt you, so you don't push that. But if, if they just look busy or they ask you to write the letter for them, this is wrong. You should really say, no, please, I supply you with uh, an email with information with my CV, and, and please write the letter yourself. It, 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 this should be confidential and it should not be written by the candidate. Th this undermines the system otherwise. And, and, and um, like Mike was saying, uh, the, the faculty actually develop a reputation uh, uh, and, and, and after a while, people know each other and, and know what a letter from a certain person means. Um, that's the way the system works. So I wanted to add something that, that Jan was urging and that Pietro mentioned just in, in passing. But if you want somebody to write an individualized letter for you, it helps if you can give them, make it easy for them. And as Pietro said it very quickly, but if you're asking somebody for a recommendation letter, email them a copy of your curriculum vita so yep. that they know more about you. Or it just may remind them of things they knew about you but forgot. Mm -hmm. So he's saying don't write the letter for them, but give them enough information that helps them write a more personalized letter. Definitely. I totally agree with that. Thank you. My name is uh, Shayma, and uh, I actually want to comment on the uh, second question here, how good young researchers from developing countries develop their collaboration skills. Um, actually, uh, this kind of activities melt the boundaries between cultures and even uh, scientific fields. So um, what I really want to say here is if we or uh, the ICTB can have something like a student chapter, student chapters distributed in the world so that they act like notes related or linked to the ICTB. I know that the ICTB is uh, supporting uh, conferences in many where, especially developing, developing countries. Uh, but if there is a student chapter somewhere, then this student chapter and any university usually captures the uh, um, intention of mm -hmm. uh, uh, undergrad and like, master students, then they can know something earlier about uh, societies like us to be, OSA, and these uh, kind of scientific uh, um, communities or societies. And I found it really very, very helpful to, to find someone in uh, in my university, who has or have, um, sorry, who has a, 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 like previous experience in the ICTB, I usually know from them about the schools and conferences where to apply. It's the same kind of experience we look for when we try to apply somewhere. So you, I mean, similar to uh, to find how to apply. Uh, and, and adapt your application, seeing CVs, uh, proposal, and proposal, and this kind of stuff. So if we can have like a student chapter in the university, an then ICTP having- An ICTP student chapter? Sorry? You mean an ICTP student chapter? Or yeah, an country? ICTP student chapter okay. mm -hmm. in the uh, country, um, mm -hmm. whatever uh, the university is, then they have something like an opportunity to, to invite one of the lecturers from the ICTP for w one of their uh, activities. And then the students 
especially undergrad students will get now to this kind of collaborative skills. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I will. I will just. I will just say one. I will totally agree with that. Now, there's. It's true that there's no ICT professional here, but personally, when I was much younger, I would have appreciated that. Um, uh, but she said something very important about student chapters. Generally, whatever you do, chemistry, optics, mechanics, robotics, whatever, there is an international society that is established, and generally, they do have student chapters. So I strongly encourage you to be affiliated to one of the student chapters of the main domain that you, the main society that uh, belongs to your area. And if there is none, please say that you want to create one. Me, for example, I've been mandated by IEEE to create student chapters of photonics in Africa. So we're actively looking for people to have my talk with you if you want to create an IEEE chapter uh, photonics in, in Egypt. They look for young people and they have fellowships specific for them. So out of the money they have, they reserve some money for young people from developing countries. And actually, I can tell you, they don't find applicants. And it's just because there is a gap of information. So the young people in developing countries don't know the opportunity exists. And the societies, they don't know how to reach people in developing countries. So make that effort to belong to a student chapter or to create one if you can. Thank you for your talk. My name is Mohammed. Uh, I think it would be more better if there is some group projects in the Hanson School. For example, uh, we're going to the sessions with the already codes, already setups, and we just do just tiny part of the work. But I, I think it would be better if there is some groups with different uh, cultures, different nations, and uh, we have to, to do the projects together. For example, somebody developed the code, somebody developed the setup. Uh, I think it, it uh, would be very beneficial for this school to more com communicate, and I think it's bit better. So I will mention that, uh, before Alicia, I will get to your comment. I will mention that, in fact, this school is starting such a uh, group collaborative project. So for the first time, there are three uh, different sessions that actually, separate from the morning sessions that were just started, as a pilot project, as a collaboration between groups from different countries, uh, the session leaders and the assistants. And um, we're trying to figure out exactly what that mechanism is, um, how to make it sustainable, how to have it be something that's not just for a day or a couple of days or two weeks, but beyond the life of the school. You can take it back to your home institution. So some of the things you're learning here even with these small, you know, introductions with the, you know, everything is already canned in some sense, these sort of introductions and the, the new techniques, those are things you can take back. But we also appreciate that when you get home, you have your advisors telling you that you need to do something. And there's, we, everyone has demands on their time. Uh, figuring out how to take something that you learn new, you're excited about, and then when you return home, you tell others about it, but actually to sustain that, that's really a big challenge. So we're, we are looking for, we're trying new ideas. This notion of group projects is something we're, we're trying here. We're going to see how it works and trying to expand it in future schools. So, um, but we're very, I mean, we appreciate your comment because it really is something that we want to have um, support you, uh, not just here right now or for the next two weeks, but something you can take home and carry with you beyond the rest of your, you know, into your careers. Thank you again. Uh, I, I think it should can be done by, for example, we have a prize for posters, but uh, we can uh, also define a prize, for example, for a good group project. It's not mandatory. It's uh, already uh, people can do this by its own choice, but uh, it, it has a very good price. I, I, I think it's the motivation that people can communicate and collaborate and make something new. I, I think it would be better for a hands-on school. OK, thanks. Thank you for the su suggestion. Thank you so much. My name is Elisha. Um, well, one of the things I want to mention has already been covered by you because you said there will be 
collaborations and um, uh, I would like the Anson School to have something like a mentor, mentee program for students so that uh, a student can link up with one of the, maybe the directors or the lecturers so that uh, probably when you are doing your research in the future, if you have papers you want to send out, you can send it to your mentor, he will look at it, criticize it and send it back to you. I think that will enhance a kind of a longer span uh, collaboration. And I really want to appreciate the organizers of this school. Uh, you guys are doing uh, excellently. Uh, I'm impressed, apart from the fact that um, most of us are maybe fully funded or partly funded. Uh, it's great. And um, when I go back to uh, my country, Nigeria, I'll make sure I tell as, as many people as possible to uh, turn in application for this school. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, because when someone is doing something and uh, you are not really sure if you are having impact, you may be discouraged. But I, I want you to forge on. You are on the right path. Thank you. So you bring up a very important point about mentors. Um, this is really important. Uh, and in fact, as part of this project, that, this new pilot project, um, we rely on actually past participants. So we've had some something like 400 people who have passed through over the past uh, eight uh, schools. And um, some of those folks, as Prerna, who is now a graduate, is now uh, a, a session leader. And there are different, uh, different past participants who are at different stages in their careers. So what we are actually trying to do is to link up. And so those of you who know you're in projects, everyone has a mentor. Right, so the people here who are in this longer term projects are, are working on a longer term effort in collaboration in groups, but there are people who are not here who are their mentors, who are at their home institutions, many of whom were past participants here. So in fact, your idea is it's very, very important to have that, to build that network. And in fact, that's one of the things that we're trying to do with that, okay, you're the, we have the 50 folks here or so, but you're not alone. There's actually the people who have come before. There are going to be the people who come after you. And what we're trying to build up is this community. And in that community will be new people, people who've been in a while, and to build that network and to draw from that as the source of having mentors. And it's really, you know, so, you, so you're in the early stages, but you, as you progress, you will be the mentor of someone <laughs> at some point. So just have that in mind. So yes, please spread the word about the school, but also uh, if you go home and you've uh, learned things, you can directly try to take bits of what's happened here and actually apply them, whether it's in a small group of your colleagues or in the department at whatever scale you want, and you may find former people already there. So one thing that we discuss a lot is whether, uh, from the point of view of building this network and, and community, what, what online tools we can have. At the moment, we only have a very basic website. Uh, and we probably don't want to use Facebook because not everybody can access that. And we're still kind of looking for a way which would be more easy to, say, share documents. Somebody writes a draft, puts it up there, others could comment and give feedback. It would be great if we found the right um, low maintenance because everybody's short of time, low maintenance, and uh, an easy way to maintain this community also online. There is one, one quick thing I would like to, to say. Um, you know, when I was a PhD student, I was going to conferences and met people, and today all of us are turning 40s, and there are faculty that I know everywhere in the world. I know people in Asia, in America, in Europe, in Africa. Most of them, I met them one day in a conference, and uh, we just became, I cannot even say friends because that's a big word, but I knew them, and all of us kind of evolved in our career. Right now, we're coming from 20 countries. Of course, you cannot keep track with everyone, but if only you make, I don't know, three, four, five friends, people that, hey, you know what, you exchange emails and you keep, you keep in touch, that's how you grow your network. And it is very, very important. You need to know that you need a network. If your network is international, it's better. If you know people in different continents, different countries, it's important. But these people, where do you meet them? It's at conferences like this. So the contacts that you are having right now, if you see, uh, you, you discuss with people and you have, <coughs> sorry, affinities, be sure that, you know, 10 years from now, this will be something important. It will be, hey, you know what, I know someone, I know a professor in India, 
and I know a professor in the US, I know a professor from Moldavia, I know a professor from Nigeria, and actually it will be a 10 year relationship, and these are the relationships that are strong. At, at our age, you meet people, it's difficult to have very, very strong relationships because we're already adults and we have already our network. You are building your academic network now. The people with whom I have the closest relationships is because 10, 15 years ago, all of us were PhD students and we were struggling to have our degree. And now we have positions and we have the strongest relationships. So value the fact that all of you are more or less at the same stage of your career and, and make contacts. And I would, uh, yeah, please. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, very simple thing I want, I would like to ask about any uh, upcoming hands on school. It would be very useful to the students if you have that kind of uh, professional workshop development sessions. Uh, it would be helpful to tell us before we, came, we come here to bring our every piece of useful material to our work because especially for the snapshot uh, session we had i realized that i had many many materials that i can use for this this two minutes presentation which will like compact the time i need which are not with me <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. because and if you knew, you would yeah use that i found it terribly to 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 bring my material back from my email and this I think so. it's fair criticism. It's fair. Uh, so I appreciate that, but let me also say from the administration standpoint, when we have 50 some odd, many of you were beat on by us to make sure, where's your poster, where's your poster, where's your poster? So, you know, if we're trying to keep track of your poster and your snapshots and, you know, different people at different levels, now you might say at some level, you know, the issue it becomes, you know, we're, we're, we're one person or a few people, right? So it's an issue of time. So our hope was that when you presented your poster, it contains all of the ideas which include, there's the abstract, so that forms the basis of your writing. And the poster, the materials there, there's ample, should be ample material from there to, to present a snapshot. It's less about having the particulars, I know you're thinking about having the details and have to have, oh, I have to have this graph or that graph, not for a snapshot. It's the key ideas, the main points. So uh, just, just to say, um, there's a balance. We appreciate, you know, we appreciate that, you know, it'd be nice to, to let you know all the details about everything and up front, but, it's, you know, at some point, there, it's just as a practical matter. Yes. Actually, I had a comment saying something like, if you can just put a diagram describing this, and I just realized that I didn't put it, I, I put the details, all the detail, details I thought that are enough, but when you have some um, uh, guidance uh, saying, if, if you just put this and you realize that you have it, but you don't I have it on your hands, yeah. like, this is the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't want to put everything. I just want to be to want to be better. <laughs> That's it. Fair enough. So uh, regarding networking, I'm not sure if uh, Mike, you may have to help me with this. So we have a Facebook page that uh, has been active at least. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so, no, no, for the 2013 one though, there is still activity going on. I mean, like, I know Professor Erin Rarika, she, she was, what do you say, posting messages and Eric Weeks was, so there are people who are in contact and we guys still occasionally say, anyone publishes a paper, there would be a link to it on archive or something. So there's some sort of activity in terms of like, call it social networking or academic networking, it's going on. So. <coughs> If anyone wants to take a lead and create a Facebook page for this hands-on, it would be really nice because you guys know each other really well. You are part of poster sessions, you are part of hands-on experiments, so you meet almost every participant before you leave this conference, right? So it's not a bad idea to someone to take the lead. 
And let me also add, if you make such a group, we would love to have that link that we would send it to future participants so they could look at your page to recommendations on how to prepare for the professional development workshops. So that, would, that, that way we have more people involved. It's not about us preparing everything and you, you know, receiving. If you, you become part of this family, this community, and if you have an idea, which is a great idea, let's think, out, think of a way in which more people can get involved so that becomes that this becomes something that we can then provide for future uh, participants but not one person is you know we're all doing this right we're building strengthening the community with all these ideas so it will be a useful platform for the participants so it's up to you whoever wants to take the lead so We do. We actually leave everything active. The Google, the Google Drive, and access your access state. You have access, you know, forever. Um, so, but I would encourage those of you who want to, let's say, any sort of idea like this, like increased communication, community building. If you ha get together, talk among yourselves, get together, make some decisions. You know, I hear maybe Google or Gmail is not the best format, but so come up with some solutions, and we'd love to work with you on that. That would be great to incorporate that and build that out and strengthen the community. I would like to say, uh, uh, to make a comment that is a little bit off, but uh, I've stumbled to the, that problem a lot of times, and I would like you to be aware of it. Be very careful about the way you write emails, particularly the way you write emails to people you don't know in academia. I receive a lot of emails from you know, young people, and I'm sure that they don't mean any harm, but when I receive an email from someone I don't know and I see sent from my iPhone, it is just negative. It's, 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 and of course, it's not like I know that the people don't mean any harm, but you should never forget that an email is a mail. An email is an electronic mail. It is a mail. Particularly when you write to someone you don't know, it has to be formal. Be polite. Salutation. The punctuation. Sentences starting with caps. It is not a text message. And sometimes the young people, because you're in this, people send you a message from their iPad, and you re yeah, Professor, this, and you see, send for my iPad. I'm like, I don't even know you. If you don't have the time to sit down in a computer to send me an email, then, and once again, if I know you, then it's different, right? I'm not saying that you cannot send emails through your iPad or iPhone or whatever. I'm not saying that. But when, for example, you apply for a position, and um, it looks like you were just like, you know, waiting the bus and you just hit send. <laughs> it is not the, be <laughs> the best start for a relationship. Be careful the way you write your emails, the salutations. As I say, most of us are not native speakers, so it's a learning process. You go on Google, you will find a lot of template letters, like, you know, how to start a letter, how to send a letter. Take one hour to kind of look that. Send letters that are, you know, formal and good and after, of course when you know people then you can you know send emails without saying hi but or without saying um, without the formal salutation and the endings but be very careful about that i've received a lot of emails particularly people coming from developing countries and that are not native english speakers and i know that they are very respectful people and they don't want to do to to disrespect me or whatever but be very careful about that Okay, and I will just finish with this comment with one uh, anecdote. Uh, one day I had an argument with a colleague because actually I sat down, I sent him a long email explaining his situation, and he replied with his iPad. And of course, the second problem when you reply with iPads or iPhones is that you tend to be short, which is it sometimes sounds snappy. So he replied with his period, boom. And I got that, I'm like, I sit down one hour to explain your situation, that's all what you have to say, and I got mad. And it's after that I realized, like, yeah, you know, I'm sorry, is, is, you know, I just read your email in the phone and wanted to reply quickly to you. 
But still, we already had an argument because to me it was disrespectful to me by replying me without saying hi, without saying goodbye, without anything in two lines. So be very careful with that. I know that you're a generation very connected, but when you send emails, particularly formal emails, if you want to send them using iPhones or whatever, be very careful to be sure that when they're sent, they are, they are in proper format. I think we'll, we'll have to, we're running sort of over and uh, maybe we can continue these uh, discussions uh, informally. So uh, let's thank Yanni and actually thank you all for a great thank discussion. You. Thank you.